Welcome back. Let's Get Physical Therapy is an educational podcast brought to you by MedStar Health and hosted by me, physical therapist Becca Schumer. I will be sharing the mic with tons of healthcare professionals with the goal of educating and inspiring fellow PTs and future PTs. We hope you find this both informative and inspirational, ultimately optimizing how we treat our patients and grow as professionals. Please enjoy today's episode. Today on the podcast, I am very excited to host my colleague, Mackenzie McBain. He completed the dual degree program at Shenandoah University with his DPT and Master's of Athletic Training. He's also a board certified sports clinical specialist and certified strength and conditioning specialist. His experience has been with athletes, the active general population, and special forces in the military. Mac has a passion for mentorship and education. He leads our environment of learning and coordinates our sports residency in the greater Baltimore region. Mackenzie is a Maryland native who went to University of Maryland College Park. He is a mediocre golfer and loves to travel and do anything outdoors and recently became a dad. Congrats, Mac. I am so excited to host Mac today. I have the opportunity and privilege of working with Mac in the clinic sometimes. Uh, he is an incredible teacher, and I'm, I'm really excited just to bring this topic to you because I feel like it's often not talked about enough with regards to the neurological aspects when we have a surgery, and not just ACL, but really any any surgery where we have muscle inhibition. So as we wrap up our series on ACL surgery, I am excited to have this conversation with Mac and again, learn about the neurological impact of having a surgery. Mac, welcome to the podcast. How's it going today? Thank you. Thank you. It's going well. Good. Waking up, got my coffee here, ready to go, but no, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yep. I know the people that are listening don't know what time it is, but it's pretty early, but I'm a morning person ready to go. <laughs> Yeah, so. yeah. My my daughter got me up extra early this morning, so I was uh, I didn't really have a choice. This is good. <laughs> there you go. This is our last episode on ACL recovery surgery. We have talked about this so much, but mm-hmm. really, ACL is the topic could be its own podcast. We haven't really spoken on the neurological component, so we've talked about the surgeries, we talked about different recoveries, how we treat our athletes, but I wanted to literally pick your brain about this topic <laughs> before we get into it, though. As you know, I like to hear people's stories and how you got into the field. Why PT? Why athletic training? Why the dual role? What made you go that route? Yeah, for sure. So uh, I guess it's a pretty common story, not to be too cliche, but I was an athlete at one point. Not as athletic as I used to be, but I had gotten injured, went to PT, thought it was pretty cool. That was really the end of it there. And I went to University of Maryland for undergrad, and I started doing some business classes, kind of went that track for about a year or so, and I was good at it. It was fine. It just wasn't something that I truly, truly loved, and then I decided to declare kinesiology as my major. Did that for about a year, and I was like, well, what am I going to do with kinesiology? Um, and then one of your uh, podcast uh, speakers you've had, Kalaf Flag, ended up doing a internship at the Maryland Football House. And I was like, wow, this athletic training, physical therapy thing is pretty cool. So ended up deciding to go to grad school, did a little victory lap at Maryland, did a fifth year to kind of get the rest of my prereqs and and the rest of my resume kind of built up for grad school. And I was fortunate enough to get into Shenandoah's dual degree program, where I get to do my master's in athletic training as well as doctorate in PT. And it kind of just took off from there. Um, and then I came to MedStar because of my mentor, uh, Scott Epsley. I had one of my dual internships at the Georgetown Athletic Training Room. And then long story short, really got some good mentorship there. And then, you know, went to Loyola University. And now I'm up in the U.S. Across facility with you. So it's been a nice kind of transition in different aspects of the athletic training room as well as in the clinic. So that's how I kind of got into PT. It's just I went away from it and then came back to it. Very cool. And I have to say the Mac is just an incredible teacher. When I hear you talk to patients in the clinic, I I pick up things all the time. I'm like, oh, that was a really good way of explaining that. So I am excited (laughs) to host you today and just get into this topic. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I love analogies and all that kind of stuff. So I I, I can get on some tangents, but thanks for uh, reeling me back in sometimes. It's good. Always, always. All right. So ACL rehab, can we dive into this neurological aspect of ACL where we're missing the boat a little bit? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, you know, I used to look at ACL injuries as strictly a ligamentous injury. Let's get their quad back. Let's get them back into sport. They're going to return to play. Things are doing great. 
Well, when we have re-injury rates north of 15, 20%, which is kind of a staggering number, and when we start seeing that return to sport numbers are so poor and then return to previous level of performance is also quite poor, it it begs the it begs the question are we doing this right are we doing this well and i think the familiarity of acl injuries and reconstructions and um, repairs is something that makes us as clinicians think oh you know what i got this i've seen a number come through here a lot have gotten back to sport a lot do well and that's great but no one wants to talk about the recalcitrant quad that they've had and the acl the patient with an acl injury who's still hasn't returned to sport and it's a year after and they have a 25% quad deficit. And I think that if you still think ACLs are injury, you probably haven't seen either enough ACLs or you don't know what you don't know. A little Dunning-Kruger effect there. So it's one of those things where we're really starting to learn that it's a brain injury as much as a ligamentous injury. And we have a whole host of maladaptive behaviors of our central nervous system and our neuromuscular system after an ACL injury and reconstruction that just make it really difficult. And we're starting to learn a lot more of these neurological changes that occur after the injury. And these things don't just clear up over time. They actually persist months, years beyond injury. And it's one of those things where we really start have to looking at it as a neurocognitive rehab, not just an orthopedic rehab. I know obviously us as clinicians in the sports medicine world, I thought I was done with neuro. Well, ortho is neuro and neuro is ortho. There's a brain connected to our body and uh, the joint that we're rehabilitating. So it really is something that we're starting to learn and it makes it a lot of fun, but it definitely kind of is a little intimidating, right? When you start to learn what you don't know and it's really changing the game for how we need to approach these ACLs. I mean, I'm sure you can speak to that. We have a great strength coach with Alex Milton, Jay Dyer's program, and, you know, we can write up the most beautiful quad strengthening, you know, rate of force development, constant eccentric strengthening program. And that quad just doesn't come back. And it's because we have these different brain changes and obviously the joint, and there's a number of things we'll get into, but it just really is, uh, it's really something special and new that we're starting to learn a lot about. Yeah, we'll we'll get into like the mechanisms of what is behind mm-hmm. that actually. What is happening? What what is this arthrogenic muscle inhibition that's happening post op? Yeah, so no, this is this is great. I mean, we're gonna definitely talk about some things from like Lepley, Dustin Grooms, and a whole number of really good researchers, clinicians in this space. And so, I mean, after we have the ligamentous injury, we know that essentially some changes happen where you have pain, inflammation, peripheral deafferentation. We have some changes in the joint that occur where we are going to see reflexive motor inhibition, impaired somatic sensation. And so these different neurocognitive compensations, we just essentially have this lack of afferent input into the brain. And then we have subsequent cascade of just motor dysfunction or efferent output when you have such altered afferent input. And this has to do with you had an ACL in the middle of the joint. Now it's not, now it's disrupted. You have all this pain and swelling. And so we just have a altered somatosensory input and the brain is trying to find some way of still being efficient with movement. And so it now has to draw on other cortical resources. And we can kind of go into all the different areas that it has to pull from because we really do start to see these changes. And AMI is progressive in nature. And so it it can continue to obviously have this maladaptive behavior as the brain is trying to improve its motor output. Um, It kind of reinforces some of these behaviors. And I even think on the rehab side, we might even perpetuate some of these compensations that I think we need to be mindful of. Yeah, we also have that loss of the mechanoreceptors in the ligament Mm -hmm. itself that also impacts that that chain as well. Not just the disruption of mechanoreceptors, but also the, the disuse just, again, reinforces this cycle. So where do we where do we start? How do we start? I mean, we can go more into the science behind it, which I think is is beneficial. But you're talking yeah. about these other areas in the brain that have to pick up the slack of that area that's not working as well. What yeah. does that look like in our patients? Yeah. So I do think that knowing where to start 
we can kind of keep diving into the science and understanding, all right, so if these are certain areas that are going to be the compensatory mechanism of our ACL reconstructed knee and athlete, then we need to work on upweighting the systems that we want to train and decrease input for the ones that we know they're going to compensate for. So for example, you know, movement, we have proprioception, vestibular vision. These are all resources that our brain is drawing on to produce movement. And so after the injury, right, we have uh, a decrease in proprioception. And so our brain is going to be really heavily investing and drawing more on like the vestibular and visual system. And so things that start to start to rely on in those systems, we need to essentially decrease input from the vestibular and visual system and increase proprioception. So you want to upweight the system that you want to train. And so that's things with like, I mean, you could do virtual reality if you have that visual disturbances, you want to do cognitive motor function, functional tasks, like visual motor dual tasks, and then you want to take away vision. I know they have these special glasses that kind of disrupt the visual system that you can put on and have them do like squats and have them do squats where they kind of call out different numbers or math problems that you're having them do or have them do head turns while they kind of do different squats and things like that. And so we want to upweight, you know, the proprioceptive system. So careful with putting them on compliant surfaces, for example, early on in rehab. I know we talk about doing let's say stability training and things of that nature and i'm guilty of it i've definitely used the the foam pad or the bosu ball and i'm thinking i'm doing you know some sort of uh you know some sort of stability training and what we're actually learning is is that if you're doing that early on when the brain is starving for more afferent input from an injury that they had and you're essentially putting a tendon in place of the ligament and they have all this pain swelling and peripheral deafferentation you're now taking away the one thing that they're actually relying on, which is some kind of input from the ground and where their knee is in space, and you're taking it away. And then we're having them do a task that essentially further perpetuates and helps them or makes them more reliant on their vestibular and visual system. So it's one of those things where we need to be mindful of, okay, uh, we're going to be having changes in the brain where we have a lot of like visual motor changes and changes in the speed and imagery we have essentially you know changes in how the cerebellum processes movement errors and things of that nature and we just need to be mindful of how we want to increase proprioceptive input and so that's one thing that I, I think is really important for us to remember as clinicians is that just how the mechanisms of what we're implementing actually might not have the effect that we think it's having. You bring up a good point too. We're often eager to make rehab a little more exciting, but in that yep. beginning period, working on that pain reduction and, and swelling reduction is so huge because if the patient is having pain and, and then they're protecting their joint and they're not going to fire the muscle correctly, then it just reinforces the AMI yeah. and just prolongs that. So not not skipping the beginning part. Yep, exactly, exactly. And so one of those other things we can do to to just kind of help mitigate some of the AMI is, you know, understanding that, you know, they're going to have reduced cortical excitability, so they're going to have increased motor thresholds. And interesting enough, these changes are bilateral. Um, and so what we want to do is, is we want to like be measuring quad strength early and often and bilaterally. And we want to see these quad increase you know the quad strength increases bilaterally as we're going through rehab and ami is something that we can't see just assume that your patient has it and we need to attack these things early on so early on things that we can do to you know help mitigate some of this is uh, focal joint cooling um like nmes i used to be really against modalities i was like you know we need to get these patients moving but we can use some passive modalities to our advantage and using things that can help modulate pain can help with the recruitment of the quad. And so I'll often even get the patient in five, 10 minutes early and I'll just do some focal joint cooling with some, with some, uh, with some tens, excuse me, I think I said NMES earlier, but like tens. And so using those kind of pain modulating modalities can help with AMI and then using things like 
brush and stem, aka NMES, uh, using blood flow restriction therapy, things of that nature to help with increasing afferent input and motor output. These are things we need to be doing with our patients early and often. And I often will start with cross education, strength training, pre-op and post-op and training it hard because we know that we're going to have central changes. And so if we can help with mitigating the bilateral changes that are going to happen after an ACL injury, it just helps them stay a couple uh, rungs higher from the ladder and help, helps mitigate some of this AMI that we're going to see after the surgery and after the injury. We know we have those patients that often struggle to get their full extension back and mm -hmm. therefore they're not activating their quads 100% of the way and that can linger on and linger on. Is there any research or do you have any thoughts on this delayed activation and that delay of getting that range of motion back and the impacts of that on, on the recovery? And can that, that athlete catch up? I'm not sure if I know any specific research on how range of motion affects that, but I think anecdotally and clinically reasoning through that, I mean, if you don't achieve full terminal extension, you're definitely going to have increased ground reaction forces through the tibiofemoral, patellofemoral joint. Um, you're going to have a more sore, cranky knee, more pain, more swelling. It's going to alter your mechanics. It's going to have changes in afferent input to the brain and efferent motor output. So I definitely think that restoring that terminal knee extension is going to be crucial for this and restoring normal movement patterns and kinematics. So I definitely think it plays into it. I haven't seen any research specifically talking about AMI and lack of uh, range of motion, but I know from a um, kind of those longer perspective studies that look at even a loss of three to five degrees of extension can increase your chances and risk of osteoarthritis after an ACL um, surgery. So, you know, just being mindful of that, I, I do think we can, do think we can safely say that get that terminal knee extension back because you're going to obviously have altered movement patterns and it's not going to be helping your cause with trying to reorganize the nervous system after this surgery. We treat a lot of athletes post-op ACL and understand the importance of getting that terminal knee extension restored, but other PTs, PT students are going to listen to this and they they want that flexion back as soon as possible, but working on that extension is critical. You'll, you'll get the flexion back, but don't neglect the, the extension yeah. early on. Yeah, absolutely. Terminal knee extension, so crucial for a post-op knee. Absolutely. Absolutely. The idea of pain is prominent in my head, and I think you do a really good job of educating patients with regards to the pain and, and that causing a lot of inhibition initially. How do you educate your patients early on to know that some pain is okay? Um, so, I mean, pain is something, pain and soreness this is uh this is outside of my area of expertise right and what is pain pain is a it's an alarm bell right it's uh it's something that is a threat to the nervous system and i know with those like david butler and adrian luau could have uh could have, they have whole courses and certifications on pain so but i mean just being mindful of a knee that is hurting we have to be cognizant of, all right, what are the loads that we're giving this athlete and what is happening at their knee? If you're starting to have pain that is lingering afterwards, you will have some inhibition and it's something that might change the way they are able to load the knee. So if they have pain and it hurts, they might have, uh, they might avoid deeper needs, deeper ranges of knee flexion. They may not be able to hit the ground with as much intent. They may not be able to change direction as well. And so you're going to see altered movement patterns. And it's not one of those things that we're waving a red flag or sound the alarm bell if, uh, if one of our athletes or patients has pain, but we have to be mindful of it and see, all right, did we progress our impact and training loads too quickly? Um, how are we kind of, you know, having some ebbs and flows to their workloads during the week? We want to get it to a point where it's a quiet, happy knee, not like a painful knee or we're starting to see some swelling or they're starting to lose extension. So we we have to keep it in mind and we have to be respected, um, but we're not freaking out if they have pain, but we do have to maybe alter what we're doing to get them to a quiet knee and a happy knee because it will hinder your progress if it's just kind of a chronically sore and painful knee you're not going to get what you need to get out of uh, their rehab and they won't return to sport and you could be at risk for an increased injury um, but it's one of those things that keep a quiet knee this makes your job a lot easier 
And also, I, I also wanted to talk about the importance of educating our patients on some pain is to be expected. But mm-hmm. if and if we don't build that relationship with our patient, they're not communicating those things to us, then again, we just enter this vicious cycle of it hurts, the signals aren't getting sent, the brain pathways are not getting addressed, and then that inhibition occurs, and then we just stay in this loop, yeah. not ign- not ignoring pain, but just normalizing the pain and and finding ways to work through it so that the athlete's not compensating and, and just pushing through in, in a time where they really shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, some, again, it's, it's rehab, there's gonna be some pain, some discomfort, but, you know, if this is something that's persisting or occurs with, you know, the movement every single time, we obviously know somatosensory input changes motor efferent output. So again, we, we have to respect it, but we're not waving the red flag, but we do want to get that quiet knee again. So that that's yep. definitely a key thing in rehab. Yep. The, the studies that you share with me, and I'm going to link those in the description of the podcast, um, but one of them alluded to the fact that with muscle atrophy in the presence of AMI, that just their X strength training is not going to cut it. So what do we do? What do we do with these patients that we're, we're identifying that AMI is very it's present often? Yeah. When we identify this issue, like what do we do in addition? I know you talked about the use of the visual change of yep. the visual effect. What else can we do as PTs with these patients? Yeah. So, I mean, definitely always assume they have AMI and I guess going into more of the science behind like TENS and uh, like pre-session cooling. So TENS is going to alter EEG cortical rhythms, secondary to like sensory level and noxious stimulation. It's going to help with, it's going to disinhibit volitional quad activation, Um, NMES or Russian improves cortical spinal excitability augmented with some BFR. So just trying to look at those like pathways um that's definitely one place to start where just use modalities to your advantage again i I mentioned earlier that i was against them now i'm like really pro them for the post-op knee particularly and other things we can do are taking their focus of attention uh, away from internal cues and, and using an external focus of attention and thinking about like target-based external focus or external cues, things like that, that take it away from internal cues and putting it external is better for learning. And I actually just saw this uh, article and it hasn't, I don't have access to it. I actually just emailed the uh, the authors yeah. today, but essentially it is um, David Sherman and all, and it's brain activation and single imbalance following ACL reconstruction. And there's different things with what they're looking at. And I don't want to butcher the article because I haven't read it. And this is just based on the abstract that I have access to. But essentially, uh, a target-based external focus of attention um, may decrease motor planning or activity. So, you know, us using external cues is definitely something that's helpful. And then with their somatosensory integration uh, for postural stability that is decreased bilaterally and motor planning is increased. So it's it's really interesting to see how we can modulate neural activity with cues. And so just being mindful of how we're even coaching an exercise, like don't say straighten your knee or bend the hips. You need to use things that engender like an external cue. So I'll often use like a positive shin angle where they have to do a squat to where a knee gets somewhere, or you can use like laser pointers and things of that nature. So we need to make sure we use external focus of attention and that's going to be super important and often early on too right when you're doing your bread and butter exercises that a lot of acls are going to have with like quad sets and straight leg raises and things of that nature you can make that a cognitive challenge you can make that a dual motor task so when they're doing quad sets you can have them do like a math problem when they're doing some gait retraining why not throw a lacrosse stick in their hand or have something else where it's like head turns and things of that nature right where we're we're trying to take away from their vision and vestibular system that we know they're going to increase reliance on and make them essentially mitigate their neural compensations with these cognitive neural resources for motor control that they're going to use does that make sense Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. as you're as you're talking, I'm thinking about how draining this process can be. Oh my God. Like yeah. When you yeah. start to use that brain energy more and not rely on our, our bodies are very good cheaters. They like to go to the path of least resistance. And we don't yeah. know, kind of like what you said before, we don't know what we don't know. Mm-hmm. And 
all the more reason to, I mean, we treat a lot of kids and high school athletes, they want to be on their phones and they're distracted while they're there. So you just made me think of just the importance of being present with the treatment and, and focusing on what you're doing, the task at hand, or else these patterns are just going to get reinforced. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting, right? So I even think, and you might agree with me here, where the better the athlete and as you get to a professional athlete, I almost call them professional compensators. And what I mean by that is, is that their neuromuscular system is so advanced and so efficient and good at what they do, they can accomplish a movement task, even in a kind of a hectic, crazy environment without using their quad. And, you know, the stress shielding of the quad and the knee is definitely something that's gonna happen with AMI. They have weak quads. So if you tell them to squat, their brain is going to think, all right, what's the easiest way? What's the most efficient way I can get this movement done? And they're going to shift loads and it may look perfect visually, right? And they're going to shift loads away from the quad to their glute, back extensors, whatever else it is. And that's why you just can't assume that you give this ACL patient a movement and that it's a quad exercise or you tell them to hop from this distance to that distance right the gold standard for one of the gold standards for clearing someone who's ready to return to sport with an acl injury and you tell them to hop from one line to the other and you go okay cool yep it's a pretty good quad exercise i'm really developing their quads and their eccentric landing strength etc and their brain thinks to themselves all right how can i get from there to there in the easiest way possible and it doesn't just use the quad so we really have to construct their environment i'm really big on external constraints where you have to engender a positive shin angle upright torso get the heel up you know there's a, a load of ways you can you can construct an exercise or have them do a movement where they're going to be forced to use their quad more often so an example would be hop testing i often will sometimes have them literally hop backwards. It's pretty hard to use your hip and your calf going backwards in the sagittal plane. You really need your quad for it. Or if they're hopping, I'll have them hold a ball above their head, which engenders a more upright, positive trunk position. Or I'll have them hop where their knee has to come forward and touch a uh, like a foam roller. You know, there's different ways you can do this, right? But you need to definitely use external constraints to get the movements and let's say to kind of allocate more stress to the quad and the knee than just having them do it in their own movement selection kind of, you know, like menu where they you need to construct it for them. You can't just tell them to do it and assume it's going to work their quad. Yep. Can you explain this positive shin angle for mm -hmm. the, the PT students out there? Yep. So I'm just talking about how you need to get that knee over the toe at some point and you need to start it early and you need to start it often and just grade the load in that position. Um, knees over toes isn't bad for the patellofemoral joint, the tibiofemoral joint, um, and it's a position that they're going to have to be in in sport. And this kind of uh, goes back to one of one of my favorite papers is Scott Dye has a envelope of function paper and what that essentially talks about is tissue homeostasis of let's say the knee joint and how if you systematically progress loads the knee will adapt to those loads and so often early on i will work on positive shin angle in a tolerated position right if it's early post-op they're not going to be doing a very deep squat with a knee that's far past the toe where it's a lot of knee flexion a lot more quad dominant but we do need to expose them to it and gradually increase the demands of that position with weight strength speed etc so i will often get that position early on so they start to get comfortable with it and then progress it accordingly so they continue to adapt. But if you avoid, let's say a positive shin angle, which means more quad dominant and deeper ranges of knee flexion for a long time, and then all of a sudden you introduce it in like movement with like running and change of direction, that's a massive spike in load where you're gonna come back with a pretty angry knee. It might get a little sore, might get a little swollen. So it's just one of those things that begin early, progressively load it up and you'll avoid a lot more of a headache because that knee will be tolerant to those types of positions and forces later on in rehab where they got to be for return to sport. And I know with the BTB graph, that might be a little slower, but there's certainly mm -hmm. ways that we can still allow the knee to come forward without stressing that tendon and, and compromising that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, everyone's entry point will be a little different based on 
maybe pre-existing patellofemoral joint changes, the type of graft they have, other other things that might affect how good that position feels. But you have to start somewhere and then find that entry point into loading that's tolerated and build it up from there. So Definitely. great point. With regards to the different graft types, we have this ligament disc injury, so we know all these things are happening in our brain. What happens to the areas that the graft has taken from if it's an autograft, hamstring, tendon, patellar tendon? Does that affect? The, those pathways to the brain as well when because that's technically an injury to those tendons yeah for sure no i i definitely i definitely would agree i don't know specific research that discusses differences between hamstring slash patella tendon graft um, but i think we can extrapolate with some confidence that you know you are changing afferent input and you're changing the local tissue that you're taking this graft from um and some I've even discussed this with some friends and colleagues where you know you take the middle third of the patella tendon, you, it's kind of a surgically induced you know tendon injury where yeah. you can kind of look at it from a tendinopathy perspective where you might have some just cortical inhibition from a surgically induced tendinopathy or tendon injury. So a lot of those things that we're doing to help AMI with an ACL reconstructed or repaired knee kind of translates well to some of the tendon research we know because this goes into like Jill Cook's work and Ebony Rio's work where you do have cortical inhibition with tendinopathies and so different things with isometrics concentric eccentric work and loading and there's even some tendon neuroplastic training with like doing contractions with a metronome right you have an external auditory stimulus that helps kind of reduce this this inhibition so an analogy right since you know i talk to my patients a lot with analogies you know my analogy is is when you have inhibition your brain is putting the foot on the gas pedal and the brake at the same time when we do certain interventions let's say if it's a tendon you know i talk about the metronome it helps your brain keep the foot on the gas pedal and take the other foot off the brake and so i definitely think that when you take a you know, a graft site from another location that's a tendon, you might be contributing for sure to some of this, uh, some of these changes we see in the nervous system uh, from an AMI perspective. So, you know, also still target those areas from the graft site and just understand how that might influence your rehab as well. And I wonder, it's obviously a little too early to know this, but down the road, many, many years, it'd be interesting to study the differences between ACL reconstruction and ACL repair. And is there any difference in these brain changes? Yeah. But irregardless, we need to address it because it's yep. like, again, it's it's happening, whether the yeah. magnitude might be less, but it's still happening and, and neglecting addressing these things can have long-term ramifications and impact the patient's ability to return to sport or even daily life with for sure pain. for sure and that's why i think um the acl repair is hopefully encouraging and promising i know we don't have a ton of long-term data but obviously dr women duogi and some others in our in our network are doing this surgery and um, hopefully what we get to learn is, is that by preserving the native ligament, um, we preserve and help restore some of that afferent input into the brain and help reduce how much AMI we have and help get these quads back and help with all the afferent input that the central nervous system needs for efficient movement and efferent output. So. Maybe there's more to that story. I know that's like almost another podcast in itself. <laughs> you know, there's some studies that are really supportive of it, but also some studies that say you got to choose the right patient and it has to be the right kind of tear to be the one you want to repair. But, you know, that that is, I think, what is maybe speaking to that surgery is that, you know, if you can restore and maintain that native ligament and let it heal, you, you know, obviously have a lot of different proprioceptive qualities in a ACL and a ligament than you do in a tendon. So um, it probably helps the central nervous system reorganize a little better and more effectively when you can repair it than not. But again, I say that anecdotally, we don't have long, strong, like long term strong evidence just yet, but it's definitely growing. So I look forward to maybe when we revisit this podcast in a couple of years or five to 10 years, and maybe that's what, what we're really going to be confident in. So mm -hmm. to be determined. Yep. Again, we know that these changes can take up to you know, two years, even more, to return to normalcy. How does the later stages of rehab look? And, you know, once we get to those later stages, there's so much going on between 
getting stronger, the plyometrics, the contact stuff. There's a lot to juggle in those later stages of ACL rehab. So how do we ensure that we're not just stopping thinking or considering about these neurological changes that we still need to be addressing, not let that ball drop? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's important to note, too, that, you know, the time frame of six months, one year, two years, I mean, these changes that occur can persist indefinitely if they're not addressed. And so um, I do think the things that we can do in the later stages of rehab will help reduce or mitigate these neural compensations that we know with AMI. And so some things that we can do are going to be direct visual disruption, um, indirect stuff that you can do uh, is going to be dual pass, reactionary type drills. So for example, if you're doing an exercise and you have like, let's say it's one, two, and three, right? And you have a number and you're like, one is a single leg squat, two is a lateral bound, or and three is a double leg squat or whatever it may be, right? You pick and choose what you're doing. They have to react to, they have to do the movement and react to what you're putting out, and, you know, what you're visually giving them, like a one, two, or three of your fingers, or it could be they're running at you and you call a color out and you have a, a number of cones around you. They have to change direction reactionarily and then cut and go to that other color cone. And so these types of things where we start involving decision making and there's a cognitive challenge, right? This is starting to look a lot like sport because you may get, let's say, let's say you're doing a lot of this great work with reducing their AMI and you're doing this perfect rehab and you get their quad index back, which can be difficult and take some time. And you're like, great, my athlete has a strong quad. It's the same as the other side and relative to their body weight, it looks really good too. Well, that knee has a brain attached to it and sport is chaotic. And this goes into Alan and Matt, I think it's to Berners, um, control to chaos continuum, where we need to start exposing this quad, right? This thing that is maybe strong in its own isolated environment into a very chaotic environment that's going to emulate and simulate sports. And so what they look at in the control to chaos continuum is starting out with controlled, predictable environments, right? And then progressing along the continuum to be more and more chaotic, meaning more unpredictable, reactionary type movements, you know, going from small to big drills, going from or maybe only them by themselves on a the field to other teammates and athletes. And you can you get the point, right? And we'll definitely, I think, add this to the show notes and make sure people see this article because it's really important that these later stages of rehab don't get rushed because I think everyone gets really excited when they have 90% limb symmetry and they pass their hop testing, which, you know, for another discussion, we could even talk about how, well, clearly we're missing a lot of these uh, re-injuries that are getting cleared. But in this return to play, we should not rush this part of the continuum because these changes from the central nervous system and the neuromuscular adaptations that have happened with all these different cognitive loads and reactionary type environments, we need to take a lot of time to allow them to adapt and improve in how they're processing attention and how they're responding because that is something that is altered in the post-op knee. And we have to make sure that they're we're kind of giving these neurocognitive challenges and rehab to prepare them for return to sport. A lot of times, too, with um, these attentional demands of the control to chaos um, continuum, um, I know that we, we're starting to learn that attention influences ongoing sensory integration and neural activity. So again, it's it's a lot of this feed forward feedback type mechanism. Um, and there is what we can call like endogenous or top down attention or exogenous bottom up. So we, we have to be really, really mindful of how we are giving them different cognitive demands and return to sport demands that prepare them for what they're going to have to go back to. Because again, that quad doesn't exist in an isolated environment. It's attached to a brain, a neuromuscular system. And a lot of the things that go into movement or beyond just strength measures. We've got some good stuff in here, not necessarily related to AMI, but as we wrap up this ACL series, are there any other pearls of wisdom you want to drop on this crowd with regards to ACL <laughs> rehab? 
Um, I, I think that we just have to really stay humble with ACL rehab. I think we're just learning a lot more each year with all these different studies and researchers and clinicians out there with just all these changes that occur in the nervous system. Um, and so uh, there's another another person I like to, I'm going to name drop Meredith Chaput, I think her last name is. Um, and so, you know, she's also uh, someone that works with like Dustin Grooms and as a PhD candidate, I want to give her a shout out. I do like a lot of her work and she's been really good in pushing some of these uh, rehab principles in, in, in our space. And so it's just one of those things that keep reading those kind of authors and clinicians and researchers because that's where we're really starting to learn about these brain changes because you cannot measure AMI in the clinic. You need you need machinery, you need some fancy science tools. And so that's why it's one of those things where it's hard as a clinician to measure AMI, but you have to treat it like everyone has it. And it's one of those things that as we keep learning more, we're learning more and more that it's the brain that is in control and we have to treat the brain with the knee. And that's that's my biggest thing is just keep reading, keep following smart people, maybe, uh, you know, maybe reach out to them because there's often a lot of uh, articles that um, I'm finding that get printed on the weekly. And like, for example, that one I just referenced earlier, it's it's like one of those things where they're always willing to share what they know and what they've done. And it's just uh, take advantage of your scientific community and and really keep learning and, and ask for help sometimes. Perfect. Nack, we like to end our podcast asking our guests, what is your favorite quote? What moves you, drives you, motivates you? So, quote? yep, favorite quote of mine is, uh, it's a quote that I I picked up when I was actually at uh, Exos for one of my rotations. And it, um, it, the quote is, as to methods, there may be a million and then some, but principles are few. The man who grasps principles can successfully select his own methods. The man who tries methods, ignoring principles, is sure to have trouble. So what that, that quote saying is essentially is that principles over methods. You want to understand the mechanisms behind what we're doing and then you'll be able to better apply it across different patients and different types of pathologies and clinical presentations if you're just choosing something because it worked one time you're sure to have trouble because it may not apply to the next patient or pathology or clinical presentation you see you have to understand the mechanisms behind it and so i'm really big on principles and kind of always questioning our methods and questioning our principles because that's where growth happens and and that's what makes someone a good clinical reasoner and that's how we really make progress uh, in our field. So it's one of my favorite quotes and kind of how I operate in the clinic and and also beyond. Where can people find you? Where are you treating patients? I know you just uh, got promoted to director of the environment of learning, so I know you're doing a lot of things all over the place. So where where can people find you? So I'm not really big on social media. Um, I do consume it quite a bit, but I'm not a big uh, producer of content. Um, People can find me via email, and uh, I'm sure you can post that in the link notes. And um, often uh, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. And, you know, I'm always uh, down for a quick phone call. I definitely have uh, conversations with people all the time about what we're what we're doing, where we're going, things of that nature. So, yeah, I I, um, that's the best way to find me. Sweet. Mac, again, I appreciate your time. I know you got a lot going on. So thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks a lot, Becca. Really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for listening to the Let's Get Physical Therapy Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram at Metstar Health PT. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please give us a five-star rating and leave a review so we can reach more listeners just like you. As always, we appreciate your time and hope you join us for our next episode.